Please join me in welcoming Walter Brogan in his first visit to St. John's College in Santa Fe. He is currently Professor of Philosophy at Villanova University, where he has taught for almost 30 years. I believe that's right. Um, Walter Brogan's work focused for some time on the relationship between Aristotle and Heidegger. As is well known and documented, Heidegger's development as a thinker involved a reorientation of what he saw as Husserl's overly subjective and methodical form of phenomenology. To this purpose, Heidegger undertook several phenomenological readings of Aristotle throughout his career, and much of Walter Brogan's work sheds light on this development and this relationship. He is co-translator of Heidegger's lecture course on Aristotle's Metaphysics Theta 1 through 3 on the essence and actuality of force, and the author of a book entitled Heidegger and Aristotle, The Twofoldness of Being, which came out in 2005 on SUNY Press. These books are important for anyone interested in Heidegger's often creative and controversial interpretations of Aristotle, on the relationship between the two thinkers, or simply on the development of Heidegger's phenomenology and the, the deconstruction of the history of philosophy. However, a quick look at Walter's dozens of articles and several edited books has, that he has published over the years as a, um, shows that he's a scholar of versatility and breadth in addition to depth. He has written on many different figures in the history of philosophy, including Socrates, Plato, Nietzsche, Gadamer, Nancy, Derrida, and Agamben, and on themes as diverse as tragedy, language and writing, the relationship between Fusus and Techne, biopolitics, and the possibility of postmodern communities. On a more personal note, Walter was my dissertation advisor at graduate school, where I came to know him as a kind, generous, and simultaneously rigorous mentor. I still remember fondly my very first graduate seminar with him, a course that concerned the very idea of community. It is therefore appropriate to have him come to our community at St. John's, both to share his work and so that we can think together about the notion of an ideal human community. His talk today is entitled, Living Well, Aristotle on Democracy, Equality, and the Politics of Life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rayoni. I really appreciate it. It was great being here at St. John's, a community that from a distance I've always admired so much. Uh, and um, two times in one year, because I was also invited this year to Annapolis. So it's, it's really a, a privilege. And also to be among a community of Aristotelians, if I could say that, uh, uh, especially helpful because that's what I'll talk about tonight. And, um, I'm looking forward afterwards to the conversation that I hope can be provoked by this lecture. So I'd like to discuss today uh, primarily the first book of Aristotle's Politics, where Aristotle discusses natural life and its relationship to the life of the polis. The first book of the Politics, if not the entire text, seems to me to be determined by this conjunction of life and politics. This dichotomous thinking frames Aristotle's understanding of the relationship between ordinary life and the life of politics, between life and eusen, living well. How is this life that we live, which in Aristotle's terms is opened up in the space of the political, namely the life of Logos, the incredibly beautiful life that you live here at St. John's. How is this life related to life itself? Ultimately, I will argue today, the very meaning of life in general for Aristotle is determined by the superior term in this dichotomy of, in the conjunction of the human and the other than human life. Aristotle's definition of what it means to be human is still being worked out in philosophy today. This definition is in book one, chapter two of the politics. There he defines human being in effect 
a zoan logon ekon, the one who alone among the animals has speech. And in turn, he says, because of this, that the human being is zoan politikon, apparently establishing speech and communication as the defining condition of a genuine human community. The human being is the animal that has speech, the, the political animal. Aristotle traces the origin of the polis from the household to the village to the city, establishing in this way that the city has a natural basis or content. When the city first emerges, this natural content contained in a privative and even defective way in prior associations finally reaches its form and end toward which it is directed. Thus the city emerges from out of the prior uh, kinds of natural associations. The movement toward the city is governed by two principles. The principle of need and appetitive desire on the one hand and on the other hand, the sovereign governing force of the telos. And this leads all, this governing force of the telos, of the end, which is of course political life, leads all prior associations in the direction of the genuine fulfillment and completion and self-sufficiency, which Aristotle calls the sovereign good of all. What characterizes the village is that there is a movement from operating for the sake of basic needs to operating for the sake of non-daily non -daily needs to something more than need. But this still remains primarily a quantitative numerical extension. Aristotle makes altogether clear that these partnerships pursue merely intermediate goods that are physical and material and are not the ultimate forsake of which of life. It is as if the mere sustaining of life is not the same as the living of life. In contrast, the genuine polis is a community of a different kind. In other words, it's not a quantitative extension, but a qualitative extension. There is an eruption involved in the birth of the polis a sudden emergence at a chirological moment that is not at all a continuity with what came before. Human history and political life begins after the event that gives birth to the polis. Aristotle says, the partnership arising from the union of several villages that is complete is the city. It reaches the limit the paras of, of full self-sufficiency. And while coming into being for the sake of living, it is for the sake of living well. The city is no longer governed by its coming into being. It holds itself in its limit and end and dwells therein. The telos is the limit or border that separates coming to being and being. This staying with itself is the very meaning of completion and self-sufficiency and is why Aristotle characterizes the human being in the polis as a sovereign autonomous being, at least on the human level, the ultimate and sovereign good. According to Aristotle, the city is self-sufficient, no longer constituted by a lack, and no longer needing to take from outside itself what it needs to exist. It is no longer just living that matters, that is, being occupied and determined by appropriating what one needs to preserve life. Another way of formulating this important distinction is to say that for Aristotle, it is not that one lives, but how that is important. It is the question how that one must raise in order to distinguish the polis from other ways that humans are governed. Living in the polis 
is not just living and sustaining life. It is a way of life, a way of taking up one's life and directing it on one's own in such a way that life returns to, to life and holds itself in the end. The fulfillment of need is the final end of a need-based regime, but the final end of the human polis is a liberty from need. So there I just tried to lay out a little bit this fundamental connection that Aristotle makes and distinction that Aristotle makes between natural associations and political association. Uh, now I want to do a little more of a critical analysis of this. One of the passages in book one where it is most clear that Aristotle is drawing a firm line of demarcation, and I find that in Aristotle's politics he's constantly drawing these lines of distinction. Uh, a line of demarcation that separates the political community from all others. One of the places is in his discussion of the transformation of voice to speech. Voice is, of course, the natural condition. Speech, the political activity. Uh, in other words, the relationship. What is the relationship that Aristotle distinguishes between logos and phone? He acknowledges that animals, too, form community and communicate with one another, bees and herd animals, for example. But only those who are political, he says, have speech. Animals indicate to each other pain and pleasure. Their voice is the voice of the body. And in more advanced species, they are able to announce themselves physically to each other. But this is, uh, he says, is not speech. Though using this vocal ability, logos transcends the merely responsive and physical dimension of sounds. Aristotle says, logos is for revealing what is advantageous and what is harmful, and hence also the just and unjust, the good and bad. For Aristotle, this is what makes the political community possible and what it is about. Speech transcends mere voice because it is infused with foresight that does not respond immediately to its environment, that stands freely in relationship to its surroundings and does not simply respond to it. Logos is able to anticipate what is to come and determine with foresight what is the correct response. And the polis is the site where the ability to carry out this kind of communication and debate can flourish. What Logos does is open up the space of the political, which is a space that can hold together opposites because there's a certain distance. In other words, it's no longer the immediacy of the natural that merely responds to uh, whatever uh, is affecting it, it stands apart from it in a way that it can hold together opposites like advantageous and harmful, good and bad, just and unjust, where contraries, the good and the bad, for example, can be recognized and decisions between courses of action that open up in the space of this opposition can be negotiated. The human political being is open to contraries and thus stands between the good and the bad, the advantageous and the harmful. I think this is one of the primary reasons for the fragility of the political and the possibility that, that haunts Aristotle uh, of decadence, of the decaying, of the decline, uh, of the deterioration of political life, which so much of the politics is about. Aristotle de also declares that the polis is prior to the individual. So there we did the, the priority of, of, in a certain way, for the human being of logos over the voice. But he also speaks about the polis as prior and superior to the individual. And I want to look at that for a moment. Again, notice all the distinctions here in order to carve out the space that we enjoy so much. That, that what he seems to have to do in order to carve out that space is to constantly demarcate it against what it is not. 
And so the polis is prior to the individual. Let's look at that for a moment. Here he is addressing the citizens and why the gift of logos that makes them human gains its proper expression only within the city. Cut off from the city, the individual, he says, is an individual in name only, as when we speak of a hand made of stone. Like Plato, Aristotle views this severance as the greatest evil for humans, a state appropriate to beasts who are incapable of community or gods who have no need of it. Such an individual is deficient. The incapacity for community results in a lack of self-sufficiency and, according to Aristotle, savagery in the human individual. So, in fact, such separation, he claims, unleashes a powerful destructive force when not properly checked. He says, human beings are born naturally possessing weapons for wisdom and virtue, which are very susceptible for being used for their opposites. One supposes Aristotle to mean the close relationship of the opposites, such as tyranny and philosophy. He thereby focuses on the fragility of the human community, an experiment that situates humans between beasts and gods and risks that what makes us the best of animals may make us the worst. Aristotle considers such an individual cut off from community to be a warlike person. War is a lack of koinonia, a lack of community. It is a failure of speech. War is the deprivation of the human fulfillment. Desire for war is an unnatural condition for the human being, he says. According to him, we are by nature political, and that means, and I feel like really insisting on this, even though I'm presenting it very briefly, I think there's a lot of textual evidence for this. Uh, we are by nature political, and for Aristotle, that means nonviolent, not governed by force. It's the whole idea of the political is to overcome the natural governance by force that occurs throughout all creation. So Aristotle, for Aristotle, an example of this failure of logos that results in a coercive relationship based on force rather than freedom uh, is slavery. And I want to now speak to that part of the text, which I know you're all very familiar with, and give you my take on it if you'll allow me. Uh, so for Aristotle, the lack of individuality and the concomitant incapability of participating fully in the community as a whole is the defining characteristic of the slave. The slave is one who does not own his being or her being by nature. The slave belongs wholly to the master, is through the master. Aristotle is, and, and he uses, you know, one of the things I, I sort of w hoping I can bring out today is the extent to which the politics is constantly deploying concepts from the metaphysics. Politics and metaphysics are really thoroughly integrated for Aristotle into each other. And I think we see that constantly, and I think it's still true today. You know, the, the theory of politics is really fundamentally, in a certain way, uh, committed to working out a vocabulary that's rooted in, th in theory. So practice and theory, uh, despite all the rumors to the contrary, I think for Aristotle really go v are really very integrated with each other. And that what he's employing here in the master-slave discussion is the whole parts model. The part depends for its being, in this case, on the whole, but not vice versa. Unlike what he claims is true for the free citizen. So the slave for the master is an instrument of action, he says, that is separable from the owner, like an accidental property that belongs to the owner. But like an accidental property, it has its being only by virtue of being attached. The slave belongs to the master as an extension of the master, but one that is separable. 
The slave in that sense is the externalization of the body of the master. The slave allows the master to be outside himself and to leave the life-sustaining business of preservation and survival to his being outside himself, namely his slave, right? You see the extent to which, how are we going to establish the polis as a, as a, uh, as a community that leaves behind the business of preservation and survival? And one of the ways that we do that is through the, the, the slave. So the, the master leaves that behind while he engages in other sorts of leisurely activity that are more conducive to the circle of life that dwells in the end and stays with itself. In the slave, the self banishes itself, banishes from itself its life of need and excludes it by virtue of including it within itself as outside itself. Uh, Aristotle even suggests the use of an overseer to represent the master in guiding the slaves in the performance of those duties necessary for life in order to further free the master from his involvement with the neediness of life. However, Aristotle is very careful to differentiate the life of mastery from the free political expression. The master has the knowledge and foresight necessary for political rule, but it is turned in the wrong direction and remains connected to the natural deficiency of the physical, you know, in terms of controlling the slave. In that sense, Aristotle would agree with Marx about, um, would disagree with Marx about the dialectical dependency of master and slave. He would agree in a sense, but he would disagree in allowing that the master does have the capacity to turn away in another direction and be otherwise than a master. So if you, if you look, I think it's a really interesting connection here because Hegel and Marx both look at the master-slave relationship as a relationship of codependency, whereas Aristotle seems to think that whereas the slave is dependent on the master, the master can walk away from that dependency and turn in a different direction. The polis is the completion and end of all prior associations, and from the end, one can look down towards these other associations and encompass them. But this very threshold, the threshold between the natural and the political, that brings us to an end is also a beginning, the beginning of free and sovereign political life. It is by virtue of standing at a threshold that belongs to the master as the one who has knowledge, that the master can free himself from his mastery and differentiate himself from the slave. Aristotle says that the master is as different from the slave as the soul is from the body. As usual, this demarcation of, differ of difference is problematic, as Aristotle acknowledges when he says, he is a slave by nature who is capable of belonging to another and this is also why he belongs to another, in addition to the fact that his work is the use of the body. The slave participates in reason only to the extent of perceiving it, but does not have it. The other animals, notice that too, now we've got a further distinction here, right? It's a slave and the other animals, not perceiving reason, obey only their passions. I'm still quoting here, obey only their passions. Moreover, the need for them differs only slightly. Bodily assistance in the necessary things is forthcoming from both animals and slaves, uh, from slaves and from tame animals alike, to finish the quote. Uh, very problematic passage, to say the least. One wonders about the vast network of differences that Aristotle draws, now associating yet differentiating slaves and animals but also one wonders about how the slave can perceive reason, but not have it. Uh, I think I'll skip over this next paragraph and move to an, another topic, but um, there, there is a certain sense in which 
I, I think that um, Aristotle, and I, I want to acknowledge this, uh, Aristotle argues that uh, inasmuch as the slave is part of the polis, although doesn't share in the, in the end and can participate in the polis as sovereign, experience of sovereignty and freedom, uh, still, inasmuch as the slave belongs to the polis, and if it's a virtuous polis, uh, then the master has to be a benevolent master. Uh, and the slave is not a slave who is coerced into slavery, but is a slave by nature who is deficient in such a way as uh, to, uh, to naturally uh, need uh, the master uh, in order to belong to the polis. So there's a certain argument here that the slave is lucky. You know, and it's an argument that I think I wanted to make sure we, we thought about because it's an argument that I think is pervasive in the history of slavery. Uh, this idea that there's a certain benevolence that uh, is uh, of the true enlightened master. Uh, and so um, it's in a certain sense rooted in the kind of being of the slave according to the deficiency in the being of the slave according to Aristotle. Okay, so now to, uh, I want to show another really major area in the politics where Aristotle uh, uh, demarcates a difference between the free citizen and other human beings. And it's in the area of, of, uh, of commerce. Because as I think you already know, he bans uh, the uh, uh, commercial artists and craftsmen and people who uh, trade with other countries from citizenship. And, and I, w I, was, I wondered about that and wanted to see that as a further demarcation. Uh, and what was at stake for Aristotle in saying that they could never, if they were citizens, it would destroy the regime. So let's take a look at that. I, obviously, in a certain way, if we wanted to, we could look at it as a critique of capitalism, I suppose, right? Um, so, so besides natural slaves, there's yet another group of people that Aristotle bans from full participation in the political community, namely the, those who engage in commercial exchange. This no doubt strikes us as particularly odd since this activity has by some accounts become the central focus of political life in our times. Uh, but I, only, I really mostly want to focus on the structural principles that Aristotle uh, uses to make the, to do this banning, uh, the framework of his thinking, uh, what that governs his treatment uh, of this issue. In chapter eight of book one, Aristotle distinguishes between the acquisition of goods and the appropriation of goods. So this is a little bit technical here for a moment, but you might remember this distinction. The model for understanding appropriation is really biological. That is, appropriation has to do with matter, with the consumption of what must be incorporated into oneself in order to survive and grow. He gives the example of the yolk and the egg. Nature provides the matter for the nutrition that allows us to grow and be natural and, 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 and survive and so forth. So behind this analysis of consumerism, uh, lies the distinction of matter and form and the possibility of taking things as mere matter and separating them from their own being as appropriate for conversion into something other than what it is in itself. Aristotle argues that material possessions, properties of this sort, need to be distinguished from the supplies and instruments that are needed to provide the goods that are used in the process of appropriation. So clothing belongs to the community, sustenance, food, all of those belong to the community, but to the instruments, if the tools that you use and so forth, and the ones who go to other countries to bring back the resources, the natural resources and so forth, he has a problem with. Expertise in the use and appropriation of things he calls household management. Expertise in supplying acquisitions and crafting instruments is business expertise. This second time kind of expertise is unnatural, according to Aristotle. 
The structural point that I'd like to mention here is important, I think. What is necessary for growth and sustenance belongs to the city, but as we saw earlier, is excluded in varying degrees from full participation in political life. They are incorporated into political life, but only by virtue of becoming part of something they themselves do not fully share in. The slave, for example, has no say of his own and can belong to the polity only by virtue of providing sustenance for the one who rules over him. So in this case, at least, the slave belongs by virtue of not belonging. In one sense, he is part of the city, but in another sense, he is not part of the whole in the sense of sharing and participating in the self-sufficiency and self-rule that characterizes citizens. What emerges here then are two senses of the relationship of whole to parts. In the case of a slave, she is part of the polis, but she does not share in its end or participate in it as belonging equally to the community as a whole. She participates in the substantial being of the polis only accidentally by virtue of being attached to the master. But there is yet a different sort of exclusion that applies to tradespeople and craftspeople who craft the means of production. These people are not allowed to belong to the city and would seriously, he claims, undermine the stability and territorial security of the city were they to become citizens. Yet they are not slaves and in fact do have knowledge and expertise. These vulgar artisans, as he calls them, are not permitted the status of citizenship. They are presumably, I guess, medics, foreign associates of the city. Being apart from the natural and not directly pursuing activities that sustain their own life, but providing goods for others, they are excluded also. Their skill is without any natural limit or end because it has been detached from the fulfillment of need. And this is, the, I think, the crucial point. They're without any natural limit because they've allowed their uh, seeking of things to, to their accumulation of wealth, their driving to, uh, to get more and more from foreign lands and so forth to be detached from need. So they are necessary for the city uh, and yet are excluded from it. Uh, and he justifies, uh, I think, on the basis of, of its being natural, a vast network of appropriation uh, that even culminates in the claim on the part of Aristotle that nature makes nothing that is incomplete or purposeless and therefore necessarily must have made all of these ma things for the sake of human beings. So offers us uh, a remarkably anthropocentric view uh, of the sovereignty uh, of the free human being over all of nature. In making the distinction between prop possessions and household management on the one hand and commercial expertise on the other, Aristotle is quite harsh in his criticism of commercial expertise. He says, possessions save uh, serve the same use as commercially uh, gained wealth. But in one case, the end is increase. In the other, something else, namely self-sufficiency. So some hold that this is the work of expertise in household management, not to be distinguished from it. And they proceed on the assumption that they should either preserve or increase without limit their property in money. The cause of this is that they are serious about living, but not about living well. And since that desire of theirs is now without limit, they also desire what is productive of unlimited things. So he considers the commercialism to be a symptom of unbridled greed uh, that destroys the proper proportion of the relationship between nature and end that governs and, and regulates the, uh, the relationship between need and fulfillment. 
So the matter-form distinction collapses with the inter political introduction of commercialism, which was a fundamental collapse of Aristotle's entire metaphysical apparatus in a certain sense. So what is at issue really is the pursuit of unlimited desires. In other words, desires that have been divorced from need and are no longer tethered to the proportionate measure of logos that otherwise rules in the polis. The limitless pursuit of wealth is unnatural. It arises due to the double character of acquisition as an art in itself, the art of exchange, and also as part of possession or use. The structural problem that he addresses is the mean end distinction. When desire is detached from need, it runs rampant and is akin to the pursuit of means without end. Aristotle worries about the possibility of a perversion of a proper teleological governance of a city, whereby the end, the good of the whole, determines the means. He therefore exiles the vulgar artisans and tradesmen from the city. The banning of commercialism and the unbridled pursuit of wealth is also necessary to keep the political community intact. It is clear then that Aristotle is not into globalization, empire building, and expansionism. In Aristotle's detailed analysis of what causes the deterioration of a flourishing political community, he most often points to a failure to limit production and accumulation of goods to limit it to the household realm where the governing principle is that appetite and desire must be connected to need and necessity. Okay, so now I'm gonna now move to an, uh, another point with a similar strategy of trying to see the demarcations that Aristotle uses in order to establish the beautiful city. Uh, and I think it's really amazing at the end, the final chapter of book one, to take note of something there. He, here he distinguishes the non-political rule of the master from the rule of free people. Free people, he says, include men, women, and children. But it would be wrong not to recognize that there are differences in kind among free citizens, and that therefore not all participate in the polis in the same way. Aristotle insists that both women and children have achieved the capacity for logos and being capable of self-sufficiency should be educated and participate thereby in a flourishing, virtuous life. So that part's all good, right? Um, he points out that after all, women are half the population in the city. But human excellence, he says, is not one dimensional and the rule of logos can occur in many ways. Each of these groups, men, women, and children, not only belong to the whole of the polis, they're also part of it. So the whole part structure, again, is operative here. It is with a view to the whole that each of the parts has its proper role and place in the polis. Between husband and wife, the model of rule is political. That is, rule between equals. One would assume that this implies that as equals, each of these gender-based groups of citizens should, would rule and be ruled by turns. And both men and women would be capable of holding both positions. And indeed, this is logically true, for he says, it is not possible to rule well without having been ruled. And the capacity for ruling and for being ruled are very different things. While granting that a free citizen needs both kinds of excellence, since self-rule, after all, means that one rules oneself and is therefore ruled, both ruler and ruled, what it means to be autonomous, right? Autoarches is to be, autonomous is to be self-ruled and therefore to be both ruler and ruled. Still, nonetheless, he says, some of us are more inclined towards being ruled and others towards ruling, though both belong to the alternating circle of sovereignty. 
Aristotle arbitrates these distinctions on the basis of his earlier division of the parts of the soul. The man is more closely associated with the deliberative part of the soul, the ruling part. The woman has the power of deliberation, but it lacks authority. And she is more properly ruled than ruler. Though both male and female in principle are, both, are capable both of ruling and being ruled. This allows Aristotle to again affirm one of the mainstays of his treatise, namely that even among free persons, our souls and dispositions are not the same. And in fact, it is precisely this divergence that needs to be honored in the coming together of political regimes for the sake of the good of the whole. He argues on this basis that what counts as virtue, therefore, is in each case situational and dependent on the person and the appropriate role of this person in the polis. And then he says, for it is clear that a virtue, the virtue of justice, for example, would not be a single thing for a ruler and a ruled, but, uh, but free person who is good, but has different kinds in accordance with, uh, with which one will rule and the other be ruled. Just as moderation and courage differ in a man and a woman. For a man would be, they both have the, are capable of, uh, of uh, virtues, but they're not the same. And the exemplification of these free virtues that belong to the free human being are different for men and women. For a man, he says, would be held to be a coward if he were as courageous as a courageous woman. And a woman, talkative if she were as modest as a good man. I mean, it's extraordinary. And household management uh, differs for a man and a woman as well. For it is the work of the man to acquire and the work of women to guard and protect. But wisdom is the only virtue peculiar to the ruler. The others, it would seem, must necessarily be common to both ruler and ruled, but practical wisdom is not a virtue of one ruled, but rather true opinion. Belonging to the polis as a whole, which is how we repeat, he repeatedly characterizes the political animal who has logos and holds herself self-sufficiently in the end, does not preclude locating oneself particularly in terms of one's particular contribution to the whole according to what is suitable to one's nature. Obeying the ruler, or in the case of the polis, the law, does not, for example, necessarily make one subservient unless it is by force or necessity that one is ruled. Being ruled can be a free expression of that part of the circle of sovereignty and self-rule that requires both ruling and being ruled together. While ruling oneself holds together both ruling and being ruled in one person who takes charge of herself, in the city, many people come together and the activity of ruling and being ruled is distributed among different people who are at least capable of taking turns, even if some, in Aristotle's view, are more disposed to ruling and others to being ruled. Just as the soul needs both, the intellect as ruling and the passions as being ruled, so also does the polis. In the model that Aristotle is proposing, there is a friendship and affection in the polis that puts these otherwise opposite roles in touch with each other so that the activity and passivity, leading and receptivity, are reciprocal and co-determined as equal, just as there is no speaking without listening, even though these are opposite roles. Aristotle argues that women are better suited for receptivity, but a receptivity that freely yields the power that she has. In the end, Aristotle agrees with a statement in Sophocles' Ajax. He says, Sophocles says, to a woman, though not to a man, silence is an ornament. 
the woman who best fits among the citizens of the polis represses or is encouraged to repress the, the sovereign and authoritative aspect of her logos, part of the very trait that makes her human rather than a mere living being. And Aristotle appears not to have realized that silence is the origin of speech. Uh, so now, if you'll be patient with me for just a bit longer, I want to, to turn to a discussion of the good life in Aristotle. Uh, and my point in, trying, in going through all of these demarcations was to wonder with you whether or not they're necessarily uh, these exclusionary uh, gestures on Aristotle's part uh, are necessarily uh, necessary uh, in order for him to carve out the vision of the good life that he does. A beautiful vision, we might argue, so that the question becomes more pressing. We who live this beautiful life of Logos, do we do so on the backs of those who are excluded? And that's my, the basic question that I'm trying to raise in the paper. So let's take a look at his description of the beautiful life for just a few minutes now. Aristotle asks, uh, what is uh, the forsake of which, for which the city is established in chapter six of book three? His answer is that the city is a partnership and a community in life. Uh, that he means human life and therefore logos is obvious from what he says next. Humans are by nature political animals. Hence they strive to live together even when they have no need of assistance from one another though it is also the case that the common advantage brings them together to the extent that it falls to each to live beautifully. I'd love to spend a long time on that passage. It's a really beautiful passage. But, but uh, I'm going to, rather than read it again, I'll, I'll move on. But this whole passage, I think, is incredible. <coughs> but I only want to, I think, mark two points. The members of the political community do not need assistance from one another. That's not why we are political or why we join uh, together in community. I mean, not that we don't appreciate the assistance and everything, but that's not the motivation. It's not a coming together based on use, according to Aristotle, or an exchange of goods. We are not together because we have bread that I have bread that you need and you have shoes that I need. And yet there is a common advantage, he says. We have already seen that this word advantage is contrasted with its opposite, namely what is har harmful. So why is it advantageous in a way that is not useful for us to be together? What benefit can there be for one who has achieved sovereign self-sufficiency to, uh, an amazing claim, by the way. Have, we, have any of us achieved sovereign self-sufficiency? But anyway, uh, autonomous, autonomy. You know, it's become the whole tradition of politics in the West, I think, uh, coming out of Aristotle here. I'm, I'm using the translation self-sufficiency, but it's really, a, in, the, in the tradition, the word is autonomy, right? So, uh, freedom. Uh, this question, I think, of, of what the benefit is, is a serious one for Aristotle, as we know from his ethics. Why would the human animal be political precisely at the very point when she has achieved logos and self-rule and is fully complete in herself? We know how in the ethics what a struggle that is because he ends up saying that the best life is the life of contemplation, which is exactly the life of this fully, that's fully complete in itself. And then it's supposed to be, he starts out the ethics saying this is a political treatise, right? And so there seems to be almost a discrepancy here. But, but the poli politics in many ways, I think, clarifies uh, that the ethics is, is actually coherent in, 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 this, uh, in this way that I'll try to demonstrate. Because it's not out of need and necessity, but out of, of, out of a certain, uh, I think, excess of fullness that we need each other in, the, in a healthy, sovereign political community. Uh, so how can there be a sharing among friends whose relationship is based on the recognition of the autonomy and sovereignty of the other. Isn't that what friendship is about for Aristotle? Uh, Aristotle says the genuine polis is a space for friendship. And he speaks of the bonds that are formed and recognized in the polis. And he says, and this comes from this quote comes from the politics, not the ethics. He says, 
These bonds are the work of philia. For friendship is the pro racist the intentional choice of living together. Living well is the end of the city, and these things are for the sake of this end, not just living, but the well is what I think he really wants to emphasize, living well. And the political partnership must be regarded, regarded therefore, as being for the sake of beautiful actions and not just for the sake of belonging alongside each other in a location. Well, doesn't it describe St. John's? No. Aristotle indicates that it is not only beautiful, or not only mutual benefit as distinguished from use that brings us together, but we also come together to live beautifully. Friendship offers us the beautiful life. Finally, uh, in the same passage, he says, but we also come together for the sake of living itself. This is, to me, fascinating. But we also come together for the sake of living itself. For there is perhaps something beautiful in living just by itself, provided there is no great excess of hardships. It is clear that most men will endure much hard treatment in their longing for life, the assumption being that there is a kind of joy inherent in it and a natural sweetness. I was almost going to entitle my paper The Natural Sweetness of Life. Because look, he's gone to all this trouble to discount nature in order to establish the, the free, beauty, beautiful, the realm of living well. And in this passage, there's a certain sense in which they come back together. There's a certain natural sweetness of life uh, and a joy inherent in that that we also experience in friendship. So logos and the forethought and openness to choice that were the conditions for freedom from necessity and self-rule now are seen to open out towards others because they make it possible to live well and to participate in beautiful actions that can be made manifest and allowed to shine for their beauty for others to see. And because we can better appreciate and experience the natural sweetness of life in this way. Because they are steadfast and sovereign, friends, Aristotle, Aristotle's citizens, love each other for their own sake rather than for a desire to gain from the relationship. The point is that the truly self-sufficient happy person acts for the sake of the other, not to get something because they don't need anything, it's not based on need, but for the sake of the other, as Aristotle emphasizes throughout the politics, uh, since he or she has no need to gain from the action. Friendship then is the sheer enjoyment of the sweetness of life overflowing into the love for the other, or the love of others is this overflowing, life-affirming quality of the excellent human being. This is why Aristotle says that excess in need-based goods causes corruption, and why he bans commercialism. But excessive, overflowing virtue is to be desired. Happiness, the enjoyment of the sweetness of life, is friendship. This is a stronger statement than merely saying that friends are necessary to be happy. Speaking and acting with others is the arena for living the happy life. Once Aristotle has resolved the question of why living together as free and equal persons is the proper expression of our autonomy and freedom, he begins the project of determining what kind of community or regime is best for the fulfillment of the happiness and self-expression of those who are members who are citizens of the community. And that takes up a large part, as you know, of the politics. But the fundamental decision that Aristotle makes in establishing what a regime is, is based on his model of self-rule. There is already in self-rule a double relationship to the self of ruling and being ruled. The identity of the self is already, in other words, from the beginning, a split identity in such a way that the sovereign self 
already experiences itself as relational. The self is absolutely sovereign only by virtue of drawing itself up into itself and apart from prior dependent relationships. The structure is parallel to the one I think that we saw earlier when we discussed how the human being who has logos is not merely life, but a being that lives its life. When this sovereign self becomes a citizen and is living together with others in the shared space of the political, then ruling and being ruled, both of which belong together in the person, now needs to find its expression in the shared space of the political. Friendship is the way free people externalize themselves and experience themselves as outside and othered. Aristotle says the double character of logos as both commanding and obeying and giving and receiving is resolved by an arrangement in which the citizens are ruling and being ruled in turn. This taking turns is possible because of the double sense of the self, a double sense that in time can each in turn now gain expression. Already we can see how for Aristotle, the friendship of those who are free citizens allows best of all for the possibility of a certain externalization of the experience of the self, whereby we can recognize in the other who is now ruling ourselves as free rulers and vice versa. It is only when this arrangement of taking turns collapses and someone claims the permanent right to rule that the city as such is destroyed and tyranny takes its place. But the question with which I would like to close is this. Does Aristotle's view of political friendship as the space in which all divisions and demarcations of inside and outside and belonging and not belonging are resolved by taking turns, does this vision of living well by taking turns, right, adequately compensate for the vast structural network of inclusion and exclusion that we have seen he sets up on the way to this description of the natural sweetness of life that is experienced by free citizens. Thank you very much.